We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 today. If you want to grab your Bibles, you can open that up. You know, um, as you're doing that, here's the reality. You know, we live in a cynical world. We live in a cynical world. Nobody believes anything, and some of it rightfully so. I mean, we live in a world you never know what is truth. You never know um, if someone's telling the truth. You don't never know if the news is the truth. You never know. You just don't know anymore. I mean, you used to use, get on, I used to get on like Snopes, I think, is Snopes.com. Is this, is this story true? And now it's like it, I, don't, I don't have time to research the amount of stories that I wonder if they're true or not. We live in a cynical world. So, so, and one of the things we're cynical about as people is this. We, and, and I'm sure you can finish this sentence. Listen, if something is too good to be true, it's probably what? Not true, right? And that's the world we live in. So we hear things, oh, that's too good to be true. So in other words, it's not even true. That's why when you get a phone call from somebody that says you want a free cruise, you're like, yeah, right. Or just so you know, you want a, you know, a week down in Cancun, Mexico, and we randomly selected you. What do you mean you randomly selected me? Why are you calling me? And then you realize they didn't randomly. It's too good to be true. They want something from you. And so today I'm going to be talking about some things out of this passage that are mysteries. And what I'm going to be talking about is this, is there actually are things that sound too good to be true, but yet they're still true. There are some things in our lives that, are too, that sound too good to be true, but they're still stinking truth. Amen? Amen? The pulpit went down on me when I did that. Let's try that again. There we go. I'll stop being aggressive with that. And so I want to talk to you today about some things in Scripture that when we hear them, we go, that, that can't be that, that can't be. It, it melts our mind. It blows our mind. And so these are things that are called mysteries. And so actually the Bible uses the word mystery in several places in the Bible. And what you immediately think of when you hear mystery is this, is that, well, you're talking about something I can't understand. You might be th- sitting here thinking today, well, Jason, why are you talking about a mystery? Because if you talk about mystery, it means it's still a mystery. And it means we can't understand. So why are you talking about it? And I just want to go eat some tacos. That's what you're thinking. <laughs> I know you. But actually, it would, we would be wrong to say that when the Bible says something is a mystery, it means that we cannot know it. Actually, what it means is this. It is something about God's kingdom that our human minds just cannot comprehend. But we would make a mistake to think it's cut and dry, to think, well, then you can't understand it. That's actually not mi- what mystery means. So when you read through the scriptures and it says, well, this is a mystery. Well, I can't know it, so why am I, what, what does it matter? No, no, that's not what it means. It's a mystery to our human minds. It, we cannot comprehend. Matter of fact, the disciples were talking to Jesus about mysteries, about some of the things that when Jesus taught, they were like, I don't get what's going on. I don't understand this. And Jesus told them this. And it's out of Matthew 13. And we don't have the scripture. You could jot it down if you wanted to. Jesus says this to the disciples. And he's saying this to you today. He says, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So there are mysteries that actually aren't mysteries. They just blow our human minds. So they seem mysterious. Mysterious means we don't know how it happens. But the reality is in God's kingdom, it still happens. And so we're going to look at things that are beautiful and powerful today that you think, I don't totally get that. That sounds too good to be true. But my friends, I'm telling you, in the kingdom of God, they're still true. The word mystery means it's not obvious to our understanding. In other words, it doesn't make sense to our human minds. It does not compute. It doesn't reconcile. It it is not of our nature or our thinking. And so what Paul, what we're about to read, what he's saying to to the church and to us today, that there are mysteries to us that, that are, that just, they just, I just don't believe them. But they're still true. So open your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 3, or we're going to have it on the screens, or you can open your your, uh, your iPhone or iPad or Google Glasses or Nano Eyeball, whatever you got. Let's read the scriptures today at Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. I want you to note, he opens up this passage, letting them know he's in prison. Surely, and he's writing to a church, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. In other words, it was the administration that he had received it, he accepted it, and now it's to flow through him. That is the mystery. Everyone say the mystery. That's the mystery made known to me. So it's a mystery that's made known. So when something is made known, is it a mystery anymore? 
You don't know the answer. It's not your question. I'm just saying. It's just, it, that's what I'm saying. Some of these things with mystery we, we confuse. But it's been, known to me, been made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery. Everyone say mystery. Of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery, if I say mystery, is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in who? I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all of the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone that the administration of this mystery, say mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged. And here he ends his passage, or this um, section. Be discouraged because of my suffering. Referring back to verse 1, he's in prison. My suffering for you, which are your glory. And I want to just look at three mysteries here today that I believe God will really hopefully touch your heart. Transform you, change you, alter you. And the first one is that it's, a, it's a bit difficult as we lean into this because there, there's, there's so much out there about this first point. And the first point and first mystery out of this passage is this, number one, my suffering can work for my good and glory. My suffering can work for my good and glory. Now, to me, this sounds way too good to be true, but it's still true. Scripture still supports this and strengthens this all through the Bible. And we don't have time to get into this. And this topic of suffering, it's a huge topic. And it's a necessary topic. topic but we're, 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 this message is not about why suffering. It's not about why good things happen to bad people. This is about helping us see into what God wants to do or can do with your suffering that you're going through today. But this is to help us to be able to have an eternal purpose of the mystery of what happens in the middle of your suffering. And Paul, is when he's opening this and writing this letter, as we've already read in verse 1 and verse 13, he's talking about he's in prison. And the last one, he says, don't be discouraged because of my suffering. And so be, before I get further into this passage, there, there are things all throughout the Bible that talk about people's sufferings. They talk about people's struggles. They talk about people's challenges. That's what I love about the Word of God. It doesn't, doesn't hide the, the human reality that you and I are going to have to go through some difficult times. Anybody here ever went through a difficult time? Raise your hand. All right. You know what that's called? Suffering. And life. Yes. Someone said life. Yes. You're exactly right. It's called suffering. Some of you have gone through very significant challenges or suffering. Some of you have, have suffered, and, and it, was, it was all you could take. And it, we're not comparing suffering. Well, you, should, you didn't suffer as much as I suffered. The reality is this, we all suffer. And so all through the Bible is, is this idea that suffering is real. Because, my friends, we aren't in heaven yet. Just in case you didn't realize this, this is not heaven. There is, we, are, we, we are fallen. We are broken. We live in a sinful world. People have flesh that they have to deal with. I mean, this flesh, like uh, the, the desires of the flesh, the things of the flesh, the temptations of the flesh, the pride of life. and I mean, all of those type of things, that's our flesh. That's what we deal with. And this flesh right here is not perfect. If I hit my hand with a hammer, guess what? It's going to hurt because it's not perfect. And so many people think that Christianity is a life free of pain. Actually, that's not true. It's a life that there is suffering. There is difficulties, there is challenges, but the reality is this, what can God do in the middle 
of our suffering? What is it that he can accomplish in the middle of our suffering? And one day, everything that's happening now is preparing us for one day, for one day, for one day, there will be no suffering, there will be no tears, there will be no sorrow, there will be no death, there will be total, absolute joy, there will be no need for faith anymore because our faith will be made in, real in our sight and we will stand before God totally perfect and we can hit our hands with hammers all we want. It's going to be a good day. Except for the hammer part. You guys know what I'm saying. But there is suffering throughout the Bible. One of the, when, I hear, when I hear of suffering, I always think of, uh, of the book of Job. Anybody read the book of Job? That poor dude, man. He had, he had some serious, serious suffering that went on in his life. And outside of Jesus, I, I think of Job. And, and I'll talk more about Paul in just a moment. But here's the deal. Job was a good man. Job had done nothing wrong. Job was a righteous man. Job, Job was a, a, a man who honored God with his life. He had everything was going great for him. I mean, he, he had all the, the, his retirement was good. He had lands. He had real estate properties. He, he probably had his investments were doing well. His, his micro businesses were booming. I mean, he had livestock. He had, I mean, he had everything. It was all going great for him until one day he had a really bad day and it was all taken away from him. I mean, this dude suffered. His house was going, gone, his livestock, his kids were gone. His health was taken from him all within a moment. He lost everything, everything. He was suffering. He lost everything but his wife. I don't know what you're laughing about. I don't know what was so funny about that. Actually, I heard some people say, listen, there's probably a reason for that. And here, here the devil, the devil's like coming against Job. Let me just take a side step for a second. Don't email me with, with whatever I'm about to say. So there's some people who think, you know, the devil was like, listen, I, let's take Job. Let's take his kids. Let's take his home. Let's take his, his health. Let's take it all. And, and, and so they're doing all of that. And the, one of the demons says, oh, hey, Satan, shoot me take his wife. He goes, I think you should leave her. <laughs> she must have been a piece of work. I mean, I'm just saying. Here, here's Job. He's, I mean, he's suffering. He's sitting on a pile of ashes with boils covering his body, and his only relief is to take broken potter and scrape his boils. I mean, painful. And she walks up to him. I can see her from a distance. She leans down. She says, sweetheart, I just think you ought to curse God and die. I'm sure he was like, thank you, babe. I was waiting for someone to encourage me. I'm just saying, this guy suffered. And suffering is all through the Bible. Paul himself suffered. He's, Paul actually suffered through his whole life. I don't know if you know this or not. The apostle Paul, the, the super apostle, the, 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 the man who, who just who basically took the gospel all by himself and, and took it all, all throughout South, South Asia Minor and all these different areas and into the Greek world and, and he was persecuted and ended up losing his life in Rome and was in prison. And I mean, this is meant he was close to God. He was close to him. But he had some personal issues he worked through as well. In 2 Corinthians, he's, he's talking to God and he's writing about some things in his life. And this is what he says. He says, there is a thorn in my flesh. In other words, there's something of his body that many scholars have wondered, what was it? I don't know what it was. Was it? I, who knows? Many people think it was eyes because at the end of Corinthians he writes, you can see that I'm writing in such big letters. Many people think that, that, that it was all the different things. And many people think it was the people group that he was throwing in his flesh. I don't believe it. I think it was something physical he had to deal with. He said, I have a reoccurring chronic problem and it's driving me crazy. And I asked the Lord three times to take it away. And God said, no. And there was suffering in Paul's life. But then Paul went on to say, but the Lord, after I asked him, he said, the Lord said this, my grace is sufficient for you in your suffering. And I'm going to glory, I, he, that, actually Paul writes this, that I'm going to glory in my weakness. That just blows our mind. That the power of Christ may rest in me. I don't know what you're suffering with today, what you're going through. The reality is this. 
I, 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 we don't have time to even talk about it, and there aren't even answers to your suffering. The reality is this, that God will use your suffering for your good and for glory. I really believe it. And, he, and here's the reality, and I think part of suffering helps us to acknowledge that we're not God. We don't have all the answers. We, don't, we can't work it all out on our own. And it helps us. It keeps us rooted to our humanity and our desperation for Jesus Christ. And that's just one thing. And, and it is God, I cannot tell you that I understand God completely. That would be so silly to think. I mean, if we could put our God in our minds, then he wouldn't be God anymore. And so the Bible encourages us to surrender our weaknesses to God. What's your weakness? Surrender our brokenness. Don't hold your surrender hostage until God tells you why something happened. But to give him your weakness, to give him your suffering, to give him your imperfection, and then allow his grace and his power to then rest on you. This is the key. It's called humility that says, God, I'm broken. God, I'm hurting. God, I, I'm suffering. God, the, the news I received is, is cause, giving me panic attacks or I'm having anxiety. I don't even know why. I, I'm, God, I surrender to you. And I've asked you to remove it. For some reason you're not, but that's why I trust that you're going to use this for my good and for your glory somehow. And the author of your suffering, I don't know who it is from. It might be from the devil, it might be from our human flesh, it might be from someone in your life, it might be from your own mind or your own thoughts. I don't know all the whys, but I do know that God can make you stronger during this time of suffering. That he can make you better, that he will make you bigger, he will make you tougher, he, will, he can supernaturally hold you up and bring greatness from your weakness. This is what our God is good at doing. And in the middle of your suffering, he can reveal the mystery that when you feel all alone, all of a sudden you, you get the mystery, actually God is with me, he is for me, he's working this for my good. That is a mystery that we can actually believe and hold on to. Many of us have endured a period of terrible pain, intense adversity, betrayal, and then after you go through it, then on the other side of it, you can look back, and all of us have done this. You look back and you say, you know what? As bad as I thought that was, when I was in the middle of it, I'm a, I'm a better person because I survived. I'm a stronger individual because I've survived. I learned something. I can look back and say, you know what? I wouldn't ever want to walk through that again, but I wouldn't trade that for the world because of what God used it to do in my life. And this is the mystery of suffering. Some of you are suffering right now, and the reality is you did nothing wrong. You were righteous like Job. You didn't, you didn't do anything wrong. But you're suffering. And you're going to the fire. I want to show you an example in Scripture. Of what Jesus has set the example for us to do. And it doesn't mean just because it's in the Bible. It means, well, just go and do that. I'm not making light to your suffering. Because only by the grace of God can you walk through pain and suffer. Only by God's grace. But this is what Peter was writing about Jesus. He says, but, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, doesn't, mean, doesn't say you overcome it. Notice that. You endure it. You survive it. This is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Listen to about what happened to Jesus. He committed no sin. In other words, he was innocent. And no deceit was found in his mouth. And when they hurled insults at him, when they slandered him, when, when they were just spitting vile at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus understood that through his suffering, God will use it for his good. And what happened is after he rose from the dead, he was exalted at the right hand of the Father. What happened is his suffering, he used it for our glory so that we could be seated with him in heavenly places. 
And you might be suffering right now, but I want you, these two words, the beginning and the end of this passage, to endure and to entrust. What does this mean? And I just, my encouragement to you today is to stick it out. Don't give up on God. Don't, don't, don't turn your back. Don't give up on yourself. Don't think, I can't, I can't deal with this suffering, so I'm just going to go off the rails. I'm going to do my own thing. Don't complain. Don't retaliate. Don't try to get even. The Scripture says to endure and entrust in God. Here's the question. Is God worth trusting in? That's faith. And say, God, I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand why I'm suffering. But, Lord, I trust you. I trust the fact this is a mystery, and I believe it's true. And you and, you and me, and somehow we can, I can experience good, and you can get glory from my suffering. That's, that's, that's the first part of this mystery today. Suffering can bring glory to God, and you will get to share in that glory one day. And what the enemy meant to harm you, my friends, God has promised that he will work it for your good. That's a mystery to me. It sounds too good to be true, but it's still true. The second mystery is this, is that salvation is a gift for everyone. Remember, Paul is writing this to the church, and he's writing this to these Gentiles. What Gentile means is they're just not Jewish. And so he's writing this to this church in Ephesus. He said, salvation is a gift for everyone. This sounds too good to be true, but my friends, it's still true. I want to look at this, this first one, look at gift. I want, you to, I want to read out of um, Romans chapter 5. Paul writes this, Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam. I, I want everyone to pay attention to this, if you can. I just want you to, to look at these words. These aren't my words. These are the Bible's words, Paul's words. Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even those who did not sin, even those who did not sin, by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift, everybody say gift, is not like the trespass, is not like the sin. For if the many died by the trespass or the sin of one man, how many more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? And this whole idea is that salvation is a gift. You can't do anything to earn it. You can't, you can't do something to somehow work up and get God's attention. So now I will give you salvation. It is a gift to you. There are many people today that think, I, I need to earn salvation. Or I need my, the, the, the deeds of my hands to somehow show God that I'm worthy of salvation. Or even after I'm saved, I know I was saved. But now I need to still carry the guilt of my past because that's how I make myself feel like understand that I'm truly saved is if I feel guilt all the time. And so you carry the shame and you beat yourself all the time on the back. And, and, and so God is saying this, you did nothing. Paul's saying this, you did nothing to get your salvation. Nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing. That's a mystery. Why? Why would God give me salvation? Why? I don't know. It sounds too good to be true. But it's still true that he has, he has saved us, that salvation is a gift. It's kind of like if I showed up at your doorstep tomorrow and I had a gift and I said, listen, I, I, I want you to have this and rang your doorbell. And you said, oh, Pastor Jason, I said, yeah, I have a gift for you. you there are two things you can say. No, I, I, I don't deserve that gift. Don't give me that. I don't want it. And you could reject it. Or the other response would be this. You could graciously say, hey, I, I don't know why you're giving this to me. I don't know why you're giving me this gift, but I accept it. I, I, and I, I, may, I, didn't, I just gave it to you. I said, I want you to have this. And God offers all of us this gift of eternal life. This gift that, that, that says no matter how, how many times, we, no, maybe I don't deserve it. No, may, maybe it, it's too much. I'm a sinner. Don't give it to me. And God's saying, listen, I just want you to have it. And so we can receive it as a gift. And you can receive it and it comes and it gives God pleasure that he gives us the gift and we receive the gift. And this is the reality. This is part of the mystery. It melts our minds. It blows our minds because it's too good to be true, but it's still true. It, your salvation is a gift. And many of us think this whole idea, yes, but it's a gift. But if I, but if I, if I, 
if I have a bad thought, then, then somehow God doesn't love me. And then if I repent, then he does love me. And I do this a lot because this is, this is one of the things in church that, that many people think is, is they're, they're walking on the precipice of eternity and it depends how good of a day they have if they're going to they're gonna make it or not. That is not the way God wants you to live. Jesus has secured your life. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, it is, a, it is a gift to you. You can do nothing to keep yourself on the edge or get yourself off the edge. He gave you salvation. You're saved. Like it or not, you're saved. You're going to heaven. And that's the first part. It's a gift. The second part is that Paul is saying this, that salvation is for everyone. Everyone say everyone. Everyone. Ephesians 3, 6 says this, this, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles who heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in who? He doesn't say in the promise of Moses, doesn't say in the promise of the law, doesn't say in the promise of, of 613 laws, doesn't say in the promise of worship at the temple, it says this, that that Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together, one body, and sharers together in the promise in who? Christ Jesus. Here's the deal. They debated. The early church in Acts chapter 15, after, after the day of Pentecost and the church was birthed, Here's what happened. The Jews had a hard time really understanding how can a Gentile now be saved. They didn't understand it. And the movement of the church was, was, was happening. And, and the question came up, how can a Gentile be a follower of Jesus? Because Jesus was the, is the Jewish Messiah. How can it, and they argued about it. They really argued about it. Matter of fact, one of the strongest pieces of language is says they were, in, they were in sharp debate that this can happen. It was very difficult, but they decided because of what happened to Peter and Cornelius, and I know I'm just I'm skipping all over a lot of this, that they came to the fact that they realized, wait a minute, the grace of God through Jesus Christ extends to the Jews and now extends to the Gentiles. And not, it just didn't, it, though Jesus was a Jewish Messiah, he also was the Messiah for the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. And so therefore, all of the world can be reconciled with God. And they are heirs with Israel, which is the promise from the beginning through the seed of Abraham. So this is the beauty of this. And so for Paul to say that Jews and Gentiles are equal together under Jesus, he was making this revolutionary statement. He was saying they are a part of this church. That, that now a Jew and a Gentile can worship together in Jesus Christ. That's, this is mind-blowing. And so Paul Here's Paul. Here's Paul who's making this statement. He was born a Jew. He was born um, a, a Pharisee. He, was, he, he had all the pedigree that you could ever have. And he was taught to hate the Jews. Or sorry, to hate the Gentiles. He, as a Jew, he was taught the Gentiles didn't have a soul. The Gentiles were like dogs. Actually, one of the words that, that they used for Gentiles was dog. And for Paul to say... That he's going to preach the gospel to the Gentile was revolutionary. And this is the mystery. It's not that you don't understand it. It just means it's too good to be true. But it's still true. The mystery that the gospel is available to the Gentiles and to the Jews as well. It's a gift available to everyone. There's no longer separations for those who cannot be saved and those who can be saved. There's no longer walls that separate anybody. The gift of salvation is for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. And I was trying to think of something that would help you understand. Kind of, well, why is this such a big deal? Yeah, like, I want you to think about this. So the Jews had a hard time understanding how the Gentiles can be brought into the covenant of Abraham. Now under, under a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so they, they were trying to figure this out. So what that would be like, so let me paint the picture for you. Maybe, let's just say a thousand Muslims got saved this week. Amen? And they came to church today, right here at Faith Bible Chapel. And they still have their burqas on. They still have their beards. They still wear their, their, their caps 
And they're just starting to understand Jesus. They're just starting to understand where, what, who is this Jesus. And they're saved, but they still, they still wear burkas. They still wear head coverings. They, but they're saved. They just received Christ. And they come and they feel our church today. How many know there will be some loving, good, loving Christians that would start freaking out? <laughs> You'd start freaking out. This is my church. Sweetheart, no, it's not. That deserved a better amen, but that's okay. I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> you need to have to, no, 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 this is my church. No, they can't. Here's the deal. We as the leadership have to say, no, no, I don't think so. The gospel, according to the Bible, is for everyone. This church is for everyone. This worship is for everyone. That free coffee, guess what? It's for everybody. Remember this, salvation is a gift, and it's for every person, no matter what gender, what race, what nationality, or what current religion. The, the reality is that the world needs Jesus, and the gospel of Jesus is for everybody on the planet. And the third mystery is number three, we can approach God with freedom and confidence. Ephesians 3.11 is this, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ, Jesus our Lord in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This doesn't make any sense whatsoever to our human minds. How can, how can a, a flawed individual, which all of us would say, yep, amen to that, I'm flawed. How can I come into the presence of God Almighty with freedom, freedom, like freedom, like any time I want, like any time, yeah. I want you to come with freedom. I've often said this, I, you know, I, I, I never want my children for, for my house to feel like it's not their house. You know, sometimes when you go over someone's house and you're like, man, I could really use a, um, a bologna sandwich right now. And you, and, you, and you start thinking, they open the fridge, you look and there's any bologna, and then they close it. I mean, you, it feels a little awkward. If I was to walk in your kitchen, hey, how y'all doing? Just go and open the fridge and just start pulling stuff out. And, yeah, how was your day today? You'd be there, get out of my fridge. I've always, I, 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 was all, I never wanted my, I wanted my house to be, man, my son can come in and kick open the door and grab the refrigerator doors, throw them open, start grabbing bologna and bread and cheese. I want him to come with confidence. Into, this is your house, son. This is yours. What belongs to me belongs to you. In confidence, you can come in here. In freedom, you can just be yourself. Why? Because I'm his father. I never want him to think that something is off limits for him in my house. It's his house, too. And this is what Paul is saying. I want you to come. I want you to, I, God said, I want you to come. I want you to sup with me. I want you to be in my presence. Listen, you come here with confidence and come, you stand up straight. You walk into God's presence. Here's the thing most people come in and you're crawling to God and you, maybe I got to bring sacrifices and may, maybe God's going to reach, strike me dead and somehow God is unreachable or he's distant or what if he really knows really who I am? Here's the newsflash he knows everything anyway. So just come into God's presence. And we think we have to approach with trembling. We have to approach with somehow to present with gifts and sacrifices. The Bible says nothing about that. It says through Jesus Christ you can approach God with freedom and confidence. And this is before, the, and I'm going to read you something that was before Jesus. Before Jesus this was not the case. You could not come with freedom or confidence. You, you, you came, and actually there the priests in the temple were the only ones, on, and the selected priest on the selected day could only go into the Holy of Holies. They, could on, they were the only ones. And if something was wrong in there, they, they tied a rope around their leg. They had little bells on the end of their robes that if for some reason something wasn't right, they didn't wash right or they had one of their, 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 uh, their garments crooked or something or they didn't have all the, the right 12 stones on their breastplate or whatever it may be. If something was wrong, guess what? They died. And so they, the, the bells would stop jingling, they think. Well, yeah, let's, let's pull them out. And so they just pull them out because they couldn't go in. I, I, think about this. Do you think those priests walked in the Holy of Holies just with confidence? Hey, God, what's going on? No way. They didn't come in there with freedom. 
They could only come in there when God said it. They didn't come in there when God said they died. And now here's this revolutionary. You can come into the presence of God Almighty anytime you want. You can come with confidence. You can open up the fridge and eat anything you want, son. This house is yours. That's what Paul's saying. And so David is writing about, about before Jesus. This is what David writes. He says, who can climb the mountain of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? In other words, nobody. And then he, th- then he lays out these four categories for you to come into the presence of God, into the holy hill. Okay? Let's, let's, one, you've got to have pure hands. In other words, you've never done anything wrong in your life. Well, that discredits all of us. You have a pure heart. In other words, you, you've never allowed anything evil, a, a, a bad emotion. You, you've never allowed anything in your heart that shouldn't be there. Well, that disqualifies all of us. Or one who doesn't lift their soul to another. What does that mean? That means that have, have you given affection somewhere else that really that affection was only to be for God? Well, disqualifies all of us. The last one is this. One who has never told a lie. Sorry, guys. This is what's called you are up the creek without a paddle. There's no chance. There's no chance. David was asking, who can climb the holy hill? Who can be in God's presence? Who can run into the kitchen and open up the fridge? Nobody. Until Jesus. Until Jesus. That's why Jesus, he said it's such a just precious way. He said, I am the door. If anyone enters me, you're saved. In other words, you are in God's presence. The only way that you can approach God is through the doorway of Jesus. I want you to hear me. The only way you can approach God is through the doorway of Jesus. There is no other gate. There is no other doorway. There is no, there, there's nothing that you can do to somehow get God's approval so you can approach. It is only through Jesus. And you can approach with confidence. You, you, he, God is available to meet you at any time, at any place. He's made himself available to you 24-7, 365. Maybe we may not take advantage of it, but he says, come in my house. And there are some of us who carry a deep feeling of guilt. There are some of us who carry a deep feeling of bitterness, questions. There's some of us who carry the sense of unworthiness. Some of us who are numb because of pain afflicted from someone else to us. But God says to you today, I want you to come. I want you to run into my presence. Paul is telling us through the word of God, I want you to come freely and confidently into the presence of God. Hebrews 4, 6, 16 says this to us. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Grace means Nothing that you did, it is only by his giving to you that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Here's the question today. Do you have any needs today? Do you have any hurts today? Do you have any unanswered questions today? Do you have a broken heart today? Do you have a rebellious heart today? Have you willingly lived your life in a way that you know that God doesn't want you to live? The scripture says this, if you are in Christ, come boldly to the throne of grace. Run to him. Run to him today. Run to him with your rebellious heart. Run to him with your, with your need. Run to him with your feeling of failure. Run to him with the emptiness that, that is inside of you. Run to him with your 
with your questions about him. Run to him with your anger. Run to him with with bitterness. Run to him in your time of need so that you can find grace and you can find mercy. This is, God's presence isn't about your worthiness. It's about his commitment to you. And it's about his goodness to you. And this is the type of God that we have. This is the type of God that we serve. That he is good. And that these mysteries, that doesn't make any Why would God want me to come into his presence when I'm, I'm, a, I'm a failure? Why would God say, hey, son, come in. Or daughter, come in here. Sit down at the table. Let's talk. Matter of fact, you sit down. I'll get you a bologna sandwich. He's loving. He says, come to me. You hear the words that, from the scripture said, come to me, all of you who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. It doesn't mean you've got to find your rest before you can come to God. It says, come to God so that you can find your rest. Come to me. Run to me. You've crossed through the door. Come on, come on, come on. Run to me. Run to me. Run to me. So that, I'm going to read this again. So that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help you in your need. This is the God that we serve. That he loves you. He's crazy about you. He adores you. Everything in his house is yours. Come freely and come confidently to the throne room of grace.